Thank you so much. It's a great honor to be here. Let's open in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, I thank you for these men and these women that are assembled this afternoon. I pray, dear Lord, that you would give me, even as I speak, compassion for them and love for them as I communicate your truth. I pray, Lord, that I would communicate accurately and boldly. Lord, I pray that I would communicate in a way that is helpful. Lord, I pray that ultimately we will receive encouragement from you today as we study the doctrine of encouragement. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So there is a children's game, and if you've ever been a child and you've been in a pool, you have probably played this game. It is called Marco Polo. It's a pretty simple game. One child will close their eyes and try to find the other children in the pool, and they will, with their eyes closed, say Marco, and then the other children, other parts of the pool, will say Polo, and you move in that direction and you find the person uh, that is making that sound. Ten years ago, my oldest son, Parker, left New York to move to Georgia to live with his grandparents uh, for two reasons. Number one, he wanted to get Georgia State residency so that he could go to the University of Georgia. Secondly, he wanted to play football. He had never played football in his life, and so he wanted at least one year of playing football. When he arrived, he discovered that it was going to be a little bit harder than he thought it was going to be, and so as to encourage him, I, as a good father, purchased for him three used, inexpensive CDs, DVDs, Rocky, Rudy, and The Pursuit of Happiness. Rocky, Rudy, The Pursuit of Happiness, if you haven't seen these films, they are all the same story. It's all the same movie where someone who is an underdog who is receiving no encouragement from the outside gets encouragement from within and overcomes obstacles to be a success. Rocky, Rudy, The Pursuit of Happiness. Sadly, in the Church of Jesus Christ, we often treat one another as though the other person is either Rocky, Rudy, or the main character in The Pursuit of Happiness. In other words, we assume that people are going to succeed in the Christian life without encouragement, that they will just somehow find the strength from within to overcome. But God, in his wisdom and in his kindness, tells us, commands us, that we are to encourage one another and build one another up. If you have a copy of the scripture, please turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We're going to be looking primarily at verse 11, but I'd like to put it in context by reading verses 9 through 11, 1 Thessalonians 5, 9 through 11. Paul writes to the church at Thessalonica, For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. There's some things that I would like you to notice about this text of Scripture, the doctrine of encouragement. The first thing that I would like you to notice is that to be encouraging is to be godly. Uh, in Romans chapter 15, verse 5, Paul refers to God as the God of endurance and encouragement. So if we are encouraging one another, we are like our heavenly Father. We also see that it is godly to be encouraging from the upper room discourse. The Greek word for encourage in 1 Thessalonians 5 is parakaleo. And for those of you that are Greek students, you know that that is the correct mispronunciation of that word, parakaleo. It is the same root word uh, which Jesus uses in the upper room discourse when he talks about the comforter who will come, the paraclete. And so the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, is an encourager. When we are encouraging, we are godly. Another thing that I'd like you to see from the text is the irony of the fact that while Paul is commanding them to be encouraging, he at the same time encourages them. Uh, this is brilliant. He says, therefore, encourage one another and build one another up. And then he adds this little phrase, just as you are doing. So 
as he's commanding them to be encouraging, he encourages them and says, you are doing a good job. Just keep doing what you are doing. But the main thing that I want you to see from this text, and it is going to be the most important thing that you're ever going to hear in the course of your entire life, and that is the gospel. It is rooted in the gospel. Verse 11 does not say, encourage one another and build one another up. Verse 11 says, therefore, encourage one another and build one another up. It is in light of the gospel that we are to do this. Why? Well, because God has not destined us for wrath. Uh, There will be some people who will be writhing in hell throughout eternity, but you are not among those people. Why are you not among those people? Why? Because Jesus Christ, it says in verse 10, died for us. So that whether we're awake or whether we're asleep, whether we live or whether we die, it really doesn't matter because our sins are forgiven. Therefore, in light of the gospel, we are to encourage one another and to build one another up. This isn't just the portion of the sermon where I, in a perfunctory way, insert the gospel because that's what I am supposed to do. It is right there in the text. The doctrine of encouragement is rooted in, it is propelled by, it it is driven by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so let me encourage you, brothers and sisters, today by reminding you uh, that you should be in hell, that you have deserved hell. But God, in his love and in his mercy, before time began, chose you. He elected you, and he sent his son, Jesus, to bear your sins in his body upon the tree. And that Savior, Jesus Christ, is alive today. You have been joined to him. You have been freed from eternal damnation. You are on your way to heaven. Therefore, in light of this beautiful gospel... Encourage one another and build one another up. I hope you get that. I hope you understand that this is rooted in the gospel. And so because of that, for the believer, ultimately, everything at the end of the day is encouraging. Because at the end of the day, we are all going to be with the Lord in heaven. Conversely, for the one who is not a believer... At the end of the day, there's ultimately nothing that we can say to them which is going to be of encouragement because ultimately they are going to be damned. But for our purposes today, I'm assuming that you belong to Christ, you have to view this doctrine with the gospel as the foundation. So what I'm going to give you today is is not a pep talk. This is not a halftime speech. It is not a pat on the back. This is not how to win friends and influence people. Uh, This is not a form of of teaching you how to flatter someone else because flattery is a form of of lying. This is not um, some seminar on how to uh, exercise manipulation. I'm not going to tell you how you can catch more flies with honey than vinegar. This is not a Tony Robbins seminar. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ, and in light of that gospel, we are commanded to encourage one another and build one another up. And I realize that up to this point, I have been very redundant. I have repeated myself a lot, but if you don't get this part, then the rest of it is just going to be moralistic instructions. God has saved you, and he has told you, he has commanded you to talk to one another, to encourage each other, and to build one another up. Now, We have so many objective reasons as to why we should be encouraged. Um, I mean, even without encouragement coming from a fellow brother or sister, we have the Bible, which is filled with encouragement. We, we, We have been joined to Christ. We are in union with Christ. We are filled, we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. We we are headed toward heaven. Our names are in the book of life. We have been justified. We have been reconciled. Uh, there is no objective reason why we should be discouraged. Uh, when you sing that hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, there's that phrase in there that says, we should never be discouraged. That is true. We should never be discouraged. But for some reason, we are. And God, in his wisdom and in his kindness, has designed the Christian life and has designed the church in such a way that he has commanded us to speak to one another and to love one another by encouraging one another. So there's no valid reason for being discouraged, 
But, brothers and sisters, we do become discouraged. Why? The reason we become discouraged is because we live in a discouraging world. Or as Job says in chapter 14, verse 1, man born of woman is of few days and full of trouble. Where does discouragement come from? Well, primarily, discouragement comes from your own heart. Uh, because you are a liar. And I am a liar. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And so when we speak to ourselves, when we think thoughts, it, 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 what is natural is, is going to be discouraging. Uh, we live in a discouraging world. Turn on the television for half an hour. doesn't matter which network you are watching, but if you look at it, it's going to be spiritually discouraging. Perhaps you are in a discouraging church. Perhaps you are in a discouraging marriage. Maybe you have sickness in your body. You also have an adversary, the devil, that wants to discourage you. Maybe circumstances in your life have discouraged you. Maybe you're struggling financially. Maybe there is a, 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 an emotional depression that you are going through. We uh, have many um, ways in which we are attacked by discouragement. And so we are commanded to encourage one another and build one another up. And so the question has to be asked, why if we know that people are discouraged and why if we are discouraged ourselves and, and we know that what that feels like and why if God has commanded us to encourage one another, why don't we do it more? I mean, we're commanded to do it. We know that it's needed. Why don't we do it more? Well, let me suggest several reasons. One reason why people do not encourage is because they simply do not know how. It has never been modeled for them. They have never been encouraged themselves. And so, as a result, they don't know how to encourage another person. I can remember about 20 years ago, as a sermon illustration, I brought my son up onto the platform. He was about seven years old at the time, and I was trying to illustrate that God the Father loves the Son, and, and so I said to my son, Parker, I said, Parker, I want you to know that I love you, and I appreciate you, and I am so glad that God has given you to this family. I delight in you. I am pleased with you. And then I asked him to sit down, and I really didn't think much of it. I mean, it was just an illustration in a, in a sermon. And at the door that day, a lady came and she shook my hand. She was in her mid-80s and she had tears in her eyes, a lady who was otherwise very unemotional. She had tears in her eyes and she said, Pastor, when you asked that boy to come up on stage and you told him in front of everyone that you loved him, she said, my mother and my father lived and died and they never once ever told me that they loved me. And so... It is not an excuse, but it is an explanation. If, if you've never been encouraged, you might not know how to encourage. Others are not good encouragers because it just doesn't come natural to them. Others don't encourage because it really doesn't happen in the environment where they live. Others don't encourage because they think that it might be a form of flattery, and they've seen abuses in flattery, and therefore they don't encourage. Others don't encourage because they are hurting themselves so much, they don't think of anybody but themselves. And if that's you, let me remind you of the Lord Jesus Christ again. For no one ever suffered more than Christ. And as he is hanging upon the cross, what is he doing? He is looking for others to encourage. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Woman, behold your son. Christ upon the cross was caring for the needs of others. Others do not encourage because of jealousy. Others do not encourage because they are so self-absorbed that they don't even think about the other person. They're only thinking about themselves. But whatever the case is, let's remember, God has saved us, and in his great design, in light of the gospel, he has commanded us to encourage one another and to build one another up. So what does it look like? Well, let me give you an illustration from Scripture as to what encouragement looks like. It comes from a man by the name of Joseph. Now, you probably don't know him or remember him by that name. He first appears in Acts chapter 4, verse 36. 
And Joseph was a Levite uh, from the island of Cyprus. He moves to Jerusalem. He becomes a Christian. He's a part of the early church there. And he is such an encourager that the disciples give him a nickname or they change his name to Barnabas, which is interpreted son of encouragement. How was Barnabas an encourager? Let me cite three ways. First of all, he had a property, he had a piece of land. He sold the land and gave the money, laid it at the apostles' feet. If you need money, uh, and money can be an encouragement. Secondly, his encouragement came in his relationship with Saul of Tarsus. You remember that Saul of Tarsus was a Christ hater. He was a Christian killer. He's on his way to Damascus. He's going there to arrest, to apprehend Christians and to bring them back to, to try them and then then. Paul, or Saul, is knocked off of his horse. He goes into um, uh, Damascus there. Ananias prays for him. He receives his sight, and he has to escape from the city of, of Damascus, and he spends two years in Arabia, and then he eventually wants to make his way down to Jerusalem, and he, when he comes into Jerusalem, he wants to have fellowship with the apostles there, but they think that it is a trick. They think that he is not a real believer. How is it that the greatest Christian that has ever lived, the greatest missionary that has ever lived, is not even able to have an audience with the disciples in Jerusalem because they didn't believe him? And what was it that ultimately caused Paul to get an audience with the disciples in Jerusalem? It was Barnabas, the son of encouragement, who went to the disciples and said, he has seen the Lord and he has preached boldly in Damascus. As a side note, if you have ever tried to join a church and you were declined, please don't feel bad because the first time that the Apostle Paul tried to do that, he was declined, okay? Third example of encouragement. Paul and Barnabas find themselves in Antioch. The Holy Spirit sets them apart. They go out on what is known as the first missionary journey. They leave Antioch. They go down to Cyprus. They make their way from Cyprus north up into Pisidian Antioch, and they're about to go into the Roman region of Galatia. And as they are traveling, they have a traveling companion whose name is John Mark, with no explanation, out of nowhere, Acts 13.13, 13, it just simply says that John Mark leaves. He's gone. Paul and Barnabas complete the first missionary journey. They make their way back to Jerusalem and then um, back to Antioch. And then from Antioch, they go over to Jerusalem for the Jerusalem Council where they discuss the subject of whether or not Gentiles have to be circumcised in order to be saved. And then they go back to Antioch. And when they are in the church in Antioch, Paul says, I have an idea. Let's go back and visit the churches and let's see how they're doing. And Barnabas says, that's a great idea. Let me get John Mark and we'll be on our way. And Paul says, no. No, we're, we're, we're not going to take him. Uh, he bailed out on us the first time. We're not going to take him. And the dispute between the two was so sharp that Paul picked a new partner, Silas, and they went north and Barnabas takes John Mark with him and they go back down to Cyprus. Now, I'm not here today to argue the merits of who was right or who was wrong. If I had to decide, I would say that Paul probably was right, seeing as how they were commended to the grace of God and because Luke follows that story in his narrative. But be that as it may, what I do know is that when Paul gets to the end of his life and the last book that he writes and the last chapter in the last book that he writes, and one of the last instructions that he gives to young Timothy is what? Bring John Mark, for he is profitable to me for ministry. How in the world did John Mark go from being a quitter to being one who, at the end of Paul's ministry, was profitable to him for ministry? It was because of the ministry of encouragement through Barnabas. What I am about to tell you uh, is in no way embellished. What I'm about to tell you in no way is intended for humor, although you might find parts of it humorous. But I just want to be very, very clear with you um, about how the doctrine of encouragement has worked in my life. I was, without question, the worst child 
that I have ever known. I've seen some pretty bad kids. I have never seen any worse than me. I can remember as a five-year-old preparing for the church Christmas play when, when I first discovered the microphone. And it, it, it was one of those microphones, those silver microphones with a grill on the front. And when you would walk up to it, it would amplify your voice. And that was magical to me. And I, would just, I was supposed to say something like, you know, and they wrapped the baby in swaddling cloths and laid him in a, laid him in a manger. But instead it was a hello, hello. It was funny maybe the first seven or eight times, but when they couldn't get me away from the microphone and my father had to come to the church and take me out, and the next night as I watched my friends perform in the Christmas pageant and I sat in the congregation, I could not be with the other children because I could not be controlled. When I was in the sixth grade, I kid you not, this was the teacher's desk This was my desk right beside hers looking out at all of the other students. I could not be released into general population. I couldn't be controlled. I can remember as a teenager when we were preparing to go on our first youth camp. and We sat in the living room of Reverend Ellenberger's house in Dubois, Pennsylvania. And I remember him pointing his finger at me and saying, Eddie Moore, if I have to come get you, I will kill you. Why did he not say that to any of the other students? He didn't have to say that to any of the other students. My aunt, who died four years ago, she was 99 years old, and there were a lot of old people at the funeral. There was this one woman who was my Sunday school teacher when I was a child. Now, this woman can barely walk. All she can do is shuffle. And she shuffled the length of a very long auditorium to speak to me. And when she got to me, she had one message. And she said, you were the worst child that was ever in this church. Fifty years after the fact, she uses what little energy she's got left on planet Earth to tell me that I was the worst child she had ever met. And then something happened to me in the summer of 1977. As a 16-year-old, I was arrested by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and God revealed his son to me, and God gave me a love for Jesus, a love for the church, a love for ministry, And I wanted nothing more than to be with the people of God and to serve the people of God. That's all I wanted to do. But I had a problem. And the problem was that I was Eddie Moore. And no one would take me seriously. No one except for Jerry Hoover. Uh, Jerry was a hippie, not a hipster, a hippie. Um, When he got saved out of his dope-smoking Woodstock culture, came to the Lord, long hair, ripped jeans. Immediately his wife left him, and so he was left by himself to raise his two children. We didn't have any such thing as youth pastors in 1977, so he was the Western pencil equivalent of a youth pastor back then. And when I came to Christ, he came alongside me, and he prayed for me, and he prayed with me, And he encouraged me, and he rebuked me, and he taught me the scriptures, and he was my friend. I can remember the date. It was Thursday, February 2nd, 1978. I was a wrestler in high school, and that night I was going to wrestle Frank Veraschetti. His dad was the owner of a garbage company in Brockway, Pennsylvania, and I was supposed to wrestle him that night, and I was very nervous. And I remember after school picking up the phone and calling Jerry, saying, Jerry, I am very nervous about this match tonight. And Jerry said, take your Bible and turn to John chapter 14, verse 27, where Jesus says, peace I leave with you, my peace give I unto you. Not as the world gives unto you do I Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Now, friends, I know that Jerry and I today would be in different galaxies theologically. And I know that that's poor hermeneutics. I know that when Jesus was speaking in the upper room discourse, he did not have in mind a wrestling match which would happen at the end of the 20th century. I know that. But I also know that this guy picked up the phone 
And I also know that he pointed me to the scriptures. And I also know that for the past 41 years, every time that I have been nervous, every time I have been distraught, every time that I have been at just the end of myself, I have gone to John 14, 27. I have never forgotten it. And more importantly, what I know is that I have gone to Jesus Christ. Why? Because this guy came alongside me and he encouraged me. Brothers today, sisters, how are we to encourage one another and build one another up? Allow me to give you some practical words, some things which will maybe help you with this. The first thing I would say is this, by way of practical application. Pray with one another. Pray with one another. I didn't say pray for one another. You must pray for one another, but, but pray with one another. You know, for years and years and years, um, as a pastor, I've gone into um, hospitals. If you have a medical problem, by the way, just come and talk to me. I, I, I will be able to help you. I do not have a medical degree, but I have been in hospitals hundreds of times. When you go into hospitals as pastors, you talk to people about their ailments. I can tell you everything you want to know about the human body. So I have gone into a lot of hospitals. I've prayed with people, and I never thought that it actually meant anything. It's just something that I'm supposed to do. In 2011, I had my right hip replaced, and like a fool, on the night before the operation, I decided to watch a YouTube video of a hip replacement. Don't do that. Don't, you, you don't need to see that. And so I, I was very unnerved going into the surgery. And, and thankfully, in hospitals, they will come in and a million times they will ask you who you are and what surgery they are supposed to do. And the last one, as I was sitting in a, a, a small cubicle about to be wheeled into the operating room, um, cold and, and, and very, very nervous, uh, a man comes in and he says, what are we doing today? I said, you're replacing my right hip. He said, very good. Would you point to your right hip? This is my right hip. Very good. What is your name? My name is Edwin Moore. Very good. Uh, where do you work? Okay, I work at North Shore Baptist Church. And he said, you're a pastor? I said, yes. I can still see it in my mind's eye. I'm inside that little cubicle. He says, one second. He steps out of the cubicle, motions for a nurse. She comes walking over, and he whispers, he's a pastor. I can still see the woman. She looks to the left. She looks to the right. She closes the curtain, and she comes in, and she says, pastor, let me pray for you. And she puts her hands on me, and she pours out her heart with the most beautiful, effectual, fervent, sincere prayer to God for my health and well-being in that surgery. And it was, brothers and sisters, as if someone had taken a bucket of warm water and had poured it over my head for the peace of God that passes all understanding was then guarding my heart and my mind in Christ Jesus. And I saw for the first time the value of praying with one another. And it doesn't just have to be in a hospital. Encourage one another and build one another up. When you see a fellow member, or more importantly, when you see a fellow family member who is, for whatever reason, down, it is good to say to that person, I will pray for you. It is infinitely better to pray with that person. It's just a very practical way that we can encourage one another and build one another up. Another way that we can do this is through rebuke through rebuke, by telling the person that they are going the wrong way. Many years ago, I had a friend who was visiting me and when I was living in Columbia, South Carolina, and he wanted to drive to New York City, and this was long before the days of the GPS. And he said, how do I get to New York City? And I said, it's, it's a really simple, simple path. Here's what you do. Get on I-20, going east until you get to I-95, and then go north, as far as you can go, and once you've gone as far as you can go, you will be at the George Washington Bridge. You will be in New York City. 20 east, 95 north, simple as can be. And he gets on I-20, and he begins to drive. 
and he drives and he drives and he drives and he drives and he has to use the restroom so he pulls over and then he gets back on and he drives and he drives and he drives and he wants to get something to eat and so he gets something to eat and then he drives and he drives and he drives and he drives and he has to get gas and he gets gas and he continues to drive and he says to himself, I ought to have been to I-95 by now. I better pull over and get directions. And he did in Birmingham, Alabama. He was going in the wrong direction. What does encouragement look like for someone who is going in the wrong direction? I'm so proud of you. You've got your hands on the wheel in the proper place. You're using your blinkers. You're looking in the rearview mirrors. You're under the speed limit. No, encouragement means get off, turn around, go back. You are on the wrong path. Encourage one another, come alongside one another, and build one another up. If you see someone is going the wrong way, faithful are the wounds of a friend. What is another way that we can encourage one another? It is through gospel reminders. Now, friends, I am a pastor. I preach the gospel. I am supposed to know this. But when I get hit by life, one of the first things that happens to me is that I forget the gospel. I think that great theologian Mike Tyson put it better than anybody when he said, everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the mouth. And when life punches you in the mouth, one of the first things that is going to happen is you are going to forget the gospel. You're going to forget that God causes all things to work together for good to those that love him. You are going to forget the fact that your name is in the book of life. You're going to lose the big picture. And so what an encourager will do is an encourager will come alongside one who is, 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 is being ravaged by life. And they will say, listen, I want to help you. But let's get our mind and our focus back where it should be. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried. He was raised again on the third day. So, so let's put everything into perspective. I think sometimes we, we try to encourage one another uh, by coming along and, and maybe literally putting an arm around someone and, 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 and being of comfort to them. But the greatest encouragement that you can give is the gospel itself. The doctrine of encouragement is propelled by the gospel. Therefore, in light of the fact that Christ died for us, encourage one another and build one another up. And we are so prone to wander, so prone to forget. Please remember that the person who is hurting is probably forgetting the gospel. Bring them back to that. Let me get very practical for you. Another way that we can encourage one another and build one another up is of, by using our financial resources to help those that are in need. John the Baptist makes it very clear. He says, if you've got two, you come across someone who has nothing, take one of your two and give it to that person. I can remember when I was in seminary and struggling financially struggling I can remember that I was working minimum wage uh, renting apartments and at the time I owned a 1976 Buick Skylark a car of which my father said Ed take that car wash it and then burn it it's not even worthy to be burned at this point and I can remember a deacon from the church where I was at the time, Three Rivers Baptist Church in Columbia, South Carolina, a deacon by the name of Eric Slagle who said, um, I need to borrow your car. So he drove by, I gave him the keys. I, I, can't, I, can't, like, I was baffled. I do not know why anyone would want to borrow that car. An hour and a half later, he came by and there were four new tires on the car. I couldn't afford tires. Friends, that was 28 years ago. 28 years ago. And the encouragement of that practical gift, as long as God gives me my mind, that will stick with me. I'm not saying that we should buy the friendship of one another, but I'm saying we are members of one another. And if you know that someone in your church is hurting and you have the means to help them, 
by all means, help them. That will be very encouraging. And then my final point today is this. If you see something, say something. If you see something, say something. I just want to speak from a pastor's perspective for, for a moment. As you are delivering the word to people, and they are literally asleep. I mean, I, I'm not talking about just kind of daydreaming. I'm talking about they are in, in a coma. You could do surgery on them. They are out. And, and, and you, you have worked on your message, and you are delivering your message, and you're, 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 you're trying to communicate with them, and you see that they quite literally are asleep. It's a discouragement. But what is even a greater discouragement is when people are awake and they are listening and they are locked in and after the sermon is over, you have a conversation with that person and they speak to you as if there was a time warp and the sermon didn't actually ever exist. They don't acknowledge it at all. I know you were listening. You're right with me, brother. You're right with me. But to say nothing at all. If you go into a restaurant, not a nice restaurant, just a, a dive, a diner, and, and if the busboy comes up, not the waiter, no, 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 just the busboy comes up and takes your water glass, which is half full, and fills it from here to there, just fills it to the top, you will you will say, thank you. How in the world does your pastor stand in front of you? And I'm talking about faithful pastors who have, have, have done their homework. How does your pastor stand in front of you and feed you the living word of God week in and week out and you never so much as say, thank you? No, I'm not talking about flattery. I'm not talking about a, 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 a homiletical evaluation. I am just talking about the fact if someone is faithful to the word and they have fed you, if you see something, say something. What is it that prohibits us as Christians from encouraging one another? Why do we think that everybody is Rocky Balboa or everybody is Rudy? What about coming alongside the person and acknowledging the grace of God that is at work in them? And again, I am not talking about flattery. I am saying in light of the gospel, that person was on their way to hell. That person was an enemy of God. And God in his kindness and in, in, in his amazing grace came in and rescued that person. And now the grace of God is at work in that person that person is being sanctified. That person has been gifted by the Holy Spirit. And now that person is ministering to the body. Can you not simply say thank you? Can you not simply acknowledge either through a handwritten note or a text or an email or, 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 or just a face-to-face a, a -face word? Can you not acknowledge that what that person is doing is good and is promoting and is advancing the kingdom of God. If you see something, say something. The single mother in your church, man, she's having trouble making ends meet. She gets up and she dresses three or four kids for church and she schleps into the church carrying the kids. Really, would it take that much for you to say, sister, I notice that you're here every week and I appreciate what you're doing. I appreciate the fact that you are raising these children to hear the gospel. Why are we so stingy with our words? A few years ago, I was preaching at a pastor's conference, as I was preaching, 
there was another gentleman who had an assignment, and he preached, and um, he's a young man, and, and immediately after he preached, I sent him a very short, and at least for me, what was a, a meaningless text, I said, you did a good job, I'm proud of you. Six months later, he and I were at another conference, and he preached again, and once again, I just sent him a text after he preached, and I said, I'm really proud of you, 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 you did a good job. And after I sent him that text, he came to me and he pulled me aside. And he said, the first time you sent me that text was six months ago. When you sent it to me, I showed it to my wife, and the two of us wept uncontrollably. He said, my dad is not a Christian. I've never had a man one time ever tell me that he was proud of me. He says, now you have done it again, and I am overcome. I, I don't know emotionally how to handle this. And I am saying, why not? Why not? We have been saved, and we have been commanded by the Lord in the light of the gospel to encourage one another and to build one another up. And we are living in this discouraging world where all we're getting from our own heart or, 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 from, or from the media or from our relationships is discouragement. You go into that job and, and, and all you hear all day is vulgarity. All, all you hear is, is the Lord's ta name taken in vain. It's just discouragement after discouragement. And God says, but you, the people of God, I want you to talk to one another and I want you to encourage one another and to build one another up. Why can we not, if we see something, say something? Because here's what's happening in the church. There are these people that are striving for holiness and striving for sanctification. And they're like a child in a pool saying, Marco, 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 and, 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 and they're not hearing anything. Here's what you need to do. You need to be on the other side of the pool saying, Polo, Polo, come on. Come on, come in this direction. You're doing a good job. I'm proud of you. The grace of God is at work in your life. Encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. Father in heaven, thank you for these men and these women today who have gathered in this place to hear this message. Lord, I want to pray for the ones who are coming to this meeting discouraged themselves. The ones who, even as I was preaching, they said to themselves, oh, that someone would encourage me. Lord, will you send that encouragement to them? Lord, will you yourself please be that encouragement for them? Father, today for those to, who have heard this message, but yet they are not naturally inclined to do this, either because they have never received encouragement themselves or, Lord, because they are fearful to do so. I pray that you, by your Spirit, would convince and convict and equip and enable these dear brothers and sisters as they go back to their churches to encourage one another and to build one another up. Lord, I thank you for the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Oh, Lord, I thank you for how when all others abandon us. Lord, I thank you for the way in which the blessed Comforter comes alongside us and gives us encouragement to press on. Lord, thank you for this time, and please may your will be done with how people will apply this message. In Christ's name, amen.